but as a Jungian SI, SI, psychologist, what kind of archetypes would you say President Trump has in him, or does he represent? Well, there's a bit of the fool, <laughs> and I'm, I'm being dead serious, like because he's got a trickster element to him, eh? So, and you can see that by the way he plays on Twitter, and he's bombastic, and he's certainly an entertainer, so he's highly, highly extroverted. So there's a public performer element to him, um, and you know, from the Jungian perspective, the the fool is a precursor to the savior, right? Because the fool is often the only person who can tell the truth. And I think that one of the things that happened in the last presidential election is that people regarded Trump, not everyone obviously, and only a tiny mi majority of people, but many people regarded Trump as more honest than Clinton because his foolish, impulsive lies were more trustworthy than her carefully scripted, ideologically planned lies. So, and I'm, 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 dead, I'm dead serious about that. Like, there's something, there's something about his, his uncontrollable, relatively uncontrollable impulsivity that reveals him in a way that someone who's all persona, which was certainly the case with Clinton and her, and her teams of persona constructors, they never let the real person out. Same thing happened with Al Gore in election, you know, a, a couple of cycles before that. And so I think people, given those choices, they, 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 they went for the... They went for the trickster, and so, and so that's that's the archetype I would see at work there. Now there's also some there's also some um, devouring mother tyrannical father dynamic that played out in the last election as well, and so you know a critic of Trump would consider him a tyrannical father, and a critic of Clinton would consider her a devouring mother, and I think that the electorate also tilted slightly towards preferring the devouring trickster father to the persona compassionate devout or the tyrannical trickster father rather than the devouring compassionate mother but it was you know it was a knife edge it was a knife edge yes a very well prepared thank question. you yep. um, you've mentioned the word uh, ethics a couple of times uh, therefore, this question, um, can you define what you personally find of intrinsic value that should be part of an objective uh, debate where uh, we find a decent balance between tolerance and the freedom of speech? Um, and, um, well, do I, can I speak to you? <laughs> I want to keep it short. And, um, I mean, can you mention one uh, simple element that uh, we perhaps um, need at this moment to to that we could like uh, to not oversee uh, that is really crucial to this um, objective debate. Um, and can we also go beyond the notion of left and right because we tend to describe and mention these um, um, aspects of the political spectrum, but it is very vague. Well, as I said, most of what I'm doing, as far as I'm concerned, isn't left versus right. It's, it's something other than that. And the only reason I got involved in political issues in Canada to begin with was because I thought that the politicians overstepped the political boundary and entered into a different realm. And that was a realm that I happened to hold rather dear. And so that was cast as a political issue, but for me it wasn't. It was a philosophical or even a theological issue. Now, with regards to free speech, I mean, for me, th the issue is quite clear. Is there such a thing as hate speech? Well, you have to be a bloody fool if you don't think there's such a thing as hate speech. I mean, I'm sure many of you have uttered hate speech when you're having a vicious argument with someone that you love. I mean, people say hateful things all the time. That's not the issue. The issue is, what do you do about it? And the answer is, well, you, you let the you let the utterances play themselves out in the public domain. And the reason for that is because there isn't a better solution. It's not because there's no hatred, but, but it's, also the case th it's also the case that defining hatred is a very tricky business, and who's going to define it is even a trickier business. And, you know, like in Scotland now, the police have posters up in the subways asking Scotsmen and Scotswomen to... Um, to turn each other into the police if they say something offensive. It's like, well, 
Good luck thinking without being offensive. I mean, look, look at it this way. If you don't have a problem, you don't have to think because you don't have a problem. If you have a problem, then you have a problem, and it varies in severity. And so let's say you have a serious problem. Well, if you have a serious problem, it's going to be emotionally engaging. It's really going to matter to you how the problem is formulated and solved. It's actually going to matter. And so then you produce a diversity of opinions about the problem and how to solve it, because you need a diversity of opinions, because you have a problem and you want to solve it, but because it's emotionally engaging, you're going to find a certain number of the opinions distasteful, even hateful. Okay, well, but fair enough, but how are you going to protect yourself against that and still be able to think? And you might say, well, you don't need to think, which seems to be the default conclusion. It's like, good luck with that. Why do you have to think? You have to think because that's how you simulate the world. And so you simulate the world through thinking. You play out the consequences of a particular pattern of action. If the consequences are negative, then you don't embody the pattern of action. Then you don't die. So the reason that you think is so that you don't die. And if you're going to think about contentious things, then it's going to be offensive, terribly offensive. You're going to get the full range. And sometimes you're going to be wrong about being offended. It's like, you're wrong, seriously. And this thing you find so offensive, it's exactly what you need to correct your viewpoint. And that happens to people all the time in their life. You all know that. You know perfectly well that there are periods of time where you had to undergo a painful, radical, psychological transformation for your own good. And the way that you managed that was to learn something extremely bitter and distasteful. And if someone would have asked you, even while it was occurring, is this something you want to know? Are you happy about being exposed to it? The answer would be most definitively no because it leads you down into that state of disintegration that's necessary before you put yourself back together. And the right, right to be offensive is absolutely indistinguishable from the right to think. And so you interfere with that at your peril, especially as a consequence of like well-meaning compassion that's mostly aimed at what minimizing short-term conflict. It's just, it's, it's not, it's not, There's nothing in that that's going to have a positive outcome. All we'll get is polite people who say nothing offensive, who can't think or produce art or anything of value and who can't solve problems and who avoid short-term conflict at all cost. And that's not a society I want to live in. So, and it's not a society that's going to have much, much of a lifespan in front of it. So. Okay. Let's do, yeah.